I'm really excited because we have a pretty diverse investor panel, and this has been something that I've been wanting to put together. Never happened for four years in Startup Iceland. This year, we made it happen, so it's great. Um, first of all, maybe Helga, I think everybody knows you, and Swana, I think everybody knows you. Andrew, you should introduce yourself. What are you doing in Iceland? That's a, I'll, I'll give you the short answer. Um, I'm a, uh, a serial entrepreneur. I started my first company when I was 19, and I've been doing that for about 20 odd years. Uh, I now invest in companies. So I had a, an accelerator in Singapore with the Singapore government, uh, grew that to a number of different countries. I've now moved back into Europe and looking at investing in data-driven companies, particularly around the area of personal data. So I'm here in Iceland because I thought this was the place that should be leading in the personal data economy, the next wave of economy to hit the, the international business community. So I've been working with the government and uh, with various investors here to look at the ecosystem of developers in Iceland to say, could we empower this community to actually lead the entire world in the use of personal data? So I'm here to explore the idea of setting up a fund here with international investors plus investors on the ground. So I'll be talking to you later. <laughs> uh, we did talk about it. That was a while ago. It was a year ago. About a year ago. Well, it's now come along. So um, that's what I'm doing here. Okay. Brilliant. Um, so Helga, let's start with you. You uh, have been uh, investing for quite some time in Iceland. Um, so what's working and what's not working? Um, yes. Um, well, I personally have been with NSA Ventures for six years, but the fund has been going since 1997, and our very first investment was data because we were the first investor in Decode, and we actually managed to make money in that investment, and I think going forward, I think that's something that I, I agree we could do a lot more of. Um, I think what works for us is always syndicating. We never want to invest alone. I think it's, um, and I think also you hear all this, and I know I've said this a million times before, but I think um, people say investing is a marathon. I th actually think it's a relay race and you have different investors at different times. And we've really, really been looking to build companies working with local investors, local angels and international investors. So I'm really uh, grateful that Startup Iceland brings us these excellent investors to Iceland every year so they get to know the ecosystem as well as we do. Yeah. Jenny, you've invested in a wide variety of companies. Um, Maybe you should give a little bit of uh, background with uh, QuizUp. I think you had, you were looking at them for something, just to give context. Yeah, so um, previous to Techstars, I ran a venture group for the BBC, and we were doing strategic ventures around digital media, um, ad tech, different infrastructure. Um, I got to know the, the guys at Plain Vanilla QuizUp. Um, as we were looking to do a strategic partnership and an investment in them. Um, our fund was a uh, $25 million balance sheet um, fund, and we uh, were supposed to be strategic to the business units, which included mobile and games and um, travel and really a, a host of, um, of uh, genres. So, so what, what worked for you and what's not working in the investment sphere in terms of looking at the universe? Um, well, it's interesting because I um, started my investing career really um, investing at the A and B round. Um, I think one of the most successful things I did at the BBC was actually not do any of those investments, although financially that was pretty successful. But um, I started this little rogue accelerator, um, and that was just putting very small amounts of money into um, you know a wide group of companies. Um, you know, barely had a budget for it. You know, basically ran it myself, and it was it was kind of this little rogue group where you know everyone's like, "What's Jenny doing over there in the corner with those companies?" Um, but I, I grew that, and now um, BBC Labs is on their 10th year, um, and they've, um, they've done incredibly well, and they've really brought interesting products and services uh, to the BBC and to, other, um, and, and to other media companies. And I'm telling you this because that was one of the reasons that I joined Techstars, because I really believe in the accelerator model. So I guess my answer is, um, you know, venture is great, and um, going earlier stage, the accelerator model is really impactful. So I'm a big believer. So now we're going to flip it and give it to Swana, because, uh, you know, you're with Frumtak Ventures, and you've been with them for 
Yes, uh, I actually, um, I don't think everybody knows me, by the way, not uh, <laughs> the non Iceland. There you go, people. now is your platform. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, we at Frimtak are also entrepreneurs, the partners at Frimtak. So um, I actually uh, spent 20 years in the Netherlands and was fortunate to have a good exit in 2008. And I came back uh, to Iceland in that year and joined Frimtak in 2009 because like in Ingrid was saying and Jenny, you know, you want to give back those women and eh, want to build up the society. But I think it was really nice to come back here and, mm -hmm. and, and, and give back. So in 2009, I joined uh, Frumtak and became a partner. Right, so, and, and Frumtak Ventures, uh, tell us a little bit about what you guys invest in, what's working, what's not working. Yeah, it's funny to see, we say we are now in 15 companies. Only one of those companies are led by a woman. <laughs> So it's, it's quite, they, they, they simply don't come. And we are trying, but we see difference, they are coming. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> they are also Helga and, uh, no, no, they are, they, they are coming, definitely. But we mainly uh, invest in tech companies due to the, the mm -hmm. time limit we have and, and the potential growth mm -hmm. uh, in that sector. And you cannot really be a generalist in Iceland. Sure. And uh, so that's what we mainly focus on. What is not working in, in the strategy? I think um, what's not or what, what's our biggest uh, learning point from Primtech One, we have now two funds. Uh, although we are entrepreneurs, we have a good knowledge of running business, is uh, what has been really bad in Iceland actually is the access to money with knowledge. Yeah. With the network, with the connection to other funds, to other uh, networks, to knowledge, to uh, employees. And this is something that we are really focusing on now and has, uh, we, can, we ha can do a lot there to improve. Definitely, Excellent. add value. Excellent. Mark, in your 20 plus years of investing, what has worked for you and what's not worked for you? Well, there's too many to count what hasn't worked. <laughs> the, the one thread that's common between those that have worked is finding a founder who is the CEO that is obsessed with solving a problem. And I think it's so fucking hard what you entrepreneurs do that unless you have a very healthy and in, in the most healthy description of the word obsession, because obsession can certainly be construed as, as a lot of negative associated with that, but in the healthiest sense of it, um, I, I think that if I look at all of the entrepreneurs that I've been around that have succeeded at scale, They've been entirely obsessed with solving a problem. They wake up in the morning thinking about it. They go to bed at night thinking about it. When they are doing anything, it is running in the back of their mind in solving this problem. And I think because it is so hard that you need a leader like that to create a successful company. There's lots of different various scales of success, but the common theme I see in, in the entrepreneurs that break through and hit scale and raise capital and attract remarkable people to their teams are incredibly ins obsessed with what they're doing. And I would even go so far as to say, if you are not obsessed with solving a problem, you probably shouldn't be doing it. All right, very cool. Andrew, you've uh, been all over the world. Um, you, you worked on building the ecosystem in Singapore. Um, and now you're in London and now you're looking at Iceland. Uh, so tell us about your investment experience in different communities and cultures. What's worked, what's not worked? Gosh, that's a broad question. Um, <laughs> each, the, the hardest thing for an investor, I find, is to understand the culture of the place you're trying to invest in. So I've looked at accelerator models in California, in Singapore, and in London. And almost everywhere is trying to be California. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to be Silicon Valley. In fact, when I started in, in Singapore 15, 20 years ago, the government came to myself and my business partner at the time and said, could you help us turn Singapore into Silicon Valley by next Tuesday? <laughs> what they had was enormous amounts of money, unbelievable amounts of money, but absolutely no sense of what it takes to build a little business, much less a community. What's fundamentally different about California to Singapore, and I'm sure Iceland has its own set of characteristics, is that there is a very different culture. Uh, Silicon Valley is based on risk. Everyone's very comfortable with risk. 
The definition of the word innovation is risk and reward, trial and error. Singapore loves trial, not so happy with error. <laughs> so we built an accelerator for Singapore, which was all around process, because they are very good at process. Give them the five steps to do, they'll do it very efficiently. So at the very least, we could raise the, uh, like a rising tide lifting the boats, we could raise every entrepreneur in Singapore up to a certain level by giving them basic rules to follow. The great thing is about Singaporeans is they absolutely follow the rules. After that, then the good people rise and the good people flourish and the poor people uh, have less luck. But finding the right culture, or identifying the culture. The UK is an interesting one. Uh, London is where I live and that has a particular trading culture. London has been a port for a thousand years. They're merchants. And they too were trying to be Silicon Valley. They were trying to do the risk reward, the, the, the networking thing. They're getting very much better at it now because of people like Techstars coming in and showing them how. But for a long time, they just couldn't get it. Uh, if you can trade with entrepreneurs in London, what they need is a contract, a deal. Give them a deal and they will then do everything to close that deal. Make them network. They're not particularly good at that. At least they didn't used to be. So finding the, the culture of the place you're in is a critical thing for an investor. What I'm trying to work out now is what is the fundamental culture of Iceland? What makes you tick? I've been coming here for a year and I'm just scratching the surface. It's a fascinating place, incredibly vibrant, but I'm trying to get my head around that. So I think from an investor standpoint, that's the biggest challenge. Yeah. So maybe uh, I'll give a segue to Helga and say, what, what, should found, what, what do you look for in founders? Um, again, this undying passion about solving a problem. And it's not just, I think it's, to add to what was said earlier, I think it's not just about solving a problem because there are lots of inventors that solve problems. And I know my father has about five patents. And I keep asking, really interesting, big idea stuff. And I keep, when I was growing up, I kept asking, so what are you going to do with this patent? He's just like, now everybody knows this knowledge exists and it's there for the greater public. So he believes he solved problems, but he's not interested in money. He's a professor, he's an academic, he's a scientist, and he's not interested in monetizing the problem solution. So I think one of the, the ideas is, yes, solve a problem, be passionate about solving a problem, but also make money doing it. Because let's not kid ourselves, we are investors, we want to make money and we're making money for the people that invest in us. So a lot of it is also about solving a problem that the world needs and making money along the way. Um, so that's one of the things that we look for. One of the things I also look for, which I think is a challenge for Iceland because we're a small, homogenous um, place and we all know each other and we're all friends, don't need to introduce anybody because we all know each other, um, is the fact that we need to learn to work with different people. And this is what one of the things that takeaways from this conference today for me is listening to uh, South Trend. Chao Chen. Chao yeah. Chen, yeah. Sorry, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Because I think Guide to Iceland is such a great company because the team is so different. I've met several people from the um, team. That it's a born global company. And I have no doubt that there will be guide to everybody everywhere else because they think beyond Iceland. And I think... For Iceland, we are a very welcoming nation, and so we have to make sure that we embrace teams that are multicultural from day one. Because if you want to build a global company, you have to understand other markets. And A, you have to go into other markets. And Iceland, Icelandic people have been very, very good about traveling the world, living in different places. Um, uh, uh, and as investors, we need to be multicultural as well. But I think as teams from foundation, it's one thing hiring a salesperson in that market, but you want to have it in the founding DNA that you understand a different marketplace. So I think that's very important. And I think that's something we can do here. Jenny, what, what, what do you look for in a founder other than what they've already said? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I think my thesis has changed in terms of, you know, what types of businesses I'm, I'm looking at. Um, so, you know, when I was at the BBC, I was very much looking at enabling technologies that were solving uh, uh, core pain points for a large corporation. Um, early on um, in angel investing, I was really supporting people that I knew that were, you know, very passionate. And I think now I'm looking to solve big ideas, mm -hmm. um, or so big problems with big ideas. And um, so what do I mean? Um, you know, I'm looking at things like health and wellness, things that are really impactful on society, mm -hmm. logistics, internet of things, fintech, things that can really move the needle and, and change. So um, I think we're seeing, unfortunately, a lot of entrepreneurs that are... Um, creating kind of incremental businesses mm -hmm. and you know those can go off and, and be successful or kind of copycat businesses and I'm looking for you know people that really want to solve huge endemic problems to, to the world. 
Svana. Uh, I cannot disagree to that, uh, so we look into that as well. But what we also look in with founders, usually when we invest, we are like post-seed, early, early eight round, is that the founders have the mature, they are mature enough to realize that they will not be the CEO, you know, all the way. So uh, when the company grows, you will actually need to change and get different kind of quality leadership into the companies. And, and that's what we really look into, that uh, to build the great team. Also, I think it was Scott that said, when you build a great team, just not look at the team that is working within the company. Look also at the external, like the board and the advisors mm -hmm. and advisory boards and make that a very strong uh, team that will build the company together. Because you won't do it alone. Like Helga said, it's, it's no fun doing that. Mm -hmm. So we as investors, we come to support the company. We don't want to run it. We want to support it to grow and mm -hmm. make it a success. And I think that has changed a lot with the technology people also both investors, it is great to see three women here at the panel. Just a couple of years ago, you would not, you know, see that. It was very male dominated. Mm -hmm. And I think that also brings different emphasis on investments. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great process. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we are doing, we are, we are heading the right way, right. definitely. So let's jump a little bit into mechanics. So Mark, um, uh, how many deals do you do a year? And what is the typical size of the deals? We don't call them deals. All right, okay. <laughs> Number one. Sorry. Um, they're, they're investments in founders. And um, we have roughly, um, uh, last year we had 230 companies come through our accelerators. We are equity investors, so we have investments in those 230 companies. Then we also have a series of different pools of capital around Techstars. We have um, funds that finance uh, founders with uh, convertible notes upon in. It's an option for every founder that gets into Techstars that they're offered a $100,000 convertible note. About 91% uh, historically have taken that. That pool of capital is made up of lots of uh, angel investors, VC firms. Then we also have our own managed capital. Um, so total, we have close to half a billion dollars under management at Techstars. That is going to increase dramatically over the, the next five years. Um, so we're in between the, the companies we're financing that go through our accelerator programs plus our various uh, venture funds, we're probably investing in roughly uh, 250 to 300 companies a year. Mm -hmm. So what you've just told me is that you're managing more money than all the venture funds that was raised in Iceland put together last year, more or less. Well, we're investing globally. We're right. investing all over right. the world. So, no, no I, I have to bring this up because um, one of the conversations in the community is that there's too much money in Iceland for ventures. So I want you to comment on it and then I will start with uh, Andrew after and then Jenny. So you're and saying, you're saying uh, I, I might have misunderstood it. You said that there's too much money? Yes. So last year, three or four funds closed in Iceland. Uh, total capital of around $90 million. Is, is that correct? Investing over the next three years, you know, three to nine year cycle. And the conversation within the community is that there's too much money chasing ideas. So we have to trench back. At least the LPs believe that. Well, 90 million in funds means they'll put that money to work over a three to four year period. So you're looking at 20, 25 million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. um, I, for for a, a, a town of, of a few hundred thousand people, um, it, it, it doesn't seem obsessively large or, 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 or too large for the community. Um, most of the problems I see with startup communities where, where capital is an issue is around too much money going into a few companies instead of spread out over lots of companies. And for startup communities to succeed, you need to seed all of the ideas, not just a few. So you need, again, that long-term vision. It's too hard to predict at the seed stage which companies will succeed. And if, if the capital is interested in the long-term success of the ecosystem, then those managing the capital need to make sure 
that all of the credible ideas are being seeded, understanding that the mortality rate will hover between 30 and 40 percent over the first 18 months. That's okay. As long as all of the ideas are getting seeded, a small percentage of them will go on to be very large successes. And if that happens, then the returns will, will be fine. But um, that's generally what I find is too much of a, a, um, a, a rifle approach to trying to put that capital to work versus uh, uh, field glasses and making sure that all of the interesting ideas and all of the compelling entrepreneurs are being mm -hmm. uh, uh, financed. Right. Andrew and Swana, let's start with Andrew first. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I've only started to scratch on the size of the, uh, the ecosystem of entrepreneurs here in Iceland. Um, my guess is it's too, sl it's too small. My guess is that a lot of your smartest people have also left, and we need to get them back here. The project that we're looking at is to try and create a center of excellence, a global center of excellence here in Iceland, so you guys are better than anyone else in the world. And we will now have entrepreneurs coming here to actually do, to deliver on this personal data stuff. So I want to find a way of getting the very best people to compete to come and work here in Iceland. But in order to do that, we must bring more than just the capital that comes from Iceland. Because if we do that, the 25 million, as Mark said, is going to run out pretty quick if we're going to seed a number of these different ideas. So we have to enable international capital to come here and also add to the ecosystem of Iceland. Now, the issue that we've currently got here in Iceland is capital controls. You can invest in a business in Iceland. You just can't get your money out. Or you can, but I think the penalty is 70%. Right. Well, that's changing, is it? No. Go ahead. This because this is one of the um, reasons that it's difficult to get international investors to Iceland. So first of all, for new investment coming in, all investment that's come into Iceland since 2009 has not been bound by capital controls. The only money that's bound by capital controls is money that came in before 2009, and that's being lifted this year. So don't worry, you can get your money back out. So I just wanted to correct that. And I'm not a spokesperson <laughs> for capital controls, but I think it's a dangerous myth, and I think it's an excuse to say no rather than a reason to say yes because we don't have capital controls for new money. Um, but I also think, if I can add, I think it's also dangerous to think that we have enough money <laughs> because, I mean, obviously our fund tracks and looks at the, uh, all the investment going on in Iceland, and I think even with the three funds that were raised last year, that is, that first of all, there, there had been, we'd had a dry spell where there was only one fund work investing in Iceland, so there was a lot of um, investment that people had been looking at and waiting and storing up, so there's a lot of stored up sort of need. So th that took a lot of the first chunk of investment, which is companies that have been w looking for money for several years. Also, if you look at this um, 90 million, it's also the management fees of the funds are included in that. They also need some run-dry powder. Okay, they're doing fresh investments for three or four years, but then they need to f keep some money aside to continue uh, um, supporting those companies for the next 10 years. So I think we're still under-invested, and I hope, if there are any LPs in this room, that they understand that. Right. Well, we can just, just come back on that. Well, that's, uh, that's great to hear. Um, I've been having these discussions here for a little bit, with, particularly with some of the government folks, and they don't explain it the way you explained it. So if that's, that's the case, that's great, because we now have uh, a lot of international money who is looking at projects here in Iceland, and it will be great if the word could get out. As Mark said before, we don't hear you in London. And if, we would, if, if it was possible to hear more about what was happening in Iceland, the investor community in London is vibrant. Mm -hmm. It's two hours away. It probably takes you longer than that to climb to the top of the nearest glacier. <laughs> so it, it, it's that close. Um, if we could just get that word out more, which is what a, a group I'm associated with, we're trying to do, we want that money to come here to build this community. Brilliant. I, I've been told that um, uh, Swana? Yeah, you were going to say something, Swana. Oh, Go ahead, okay. sorry. Well, Paul, Paula was like, like well, no. signing uh, me. Just regarding you said there's too much money put in uh, to this asset class. I think this, is as, this asset class is very young in Iceland, and the LPs are mainly the pension funds, a couple of the banks. Uh, in the beginning, they were quite you know, concerned that the funds will be competing about the same de deals, mm -hmm. transactions. <laughs> uh, but that has not been the case. Yeah. There is so much we... Uh, we think we will actually 
finish our new investments in two years instead of four years. Mm -hmm. So there is enough there, but I think we need more money at seed states. Right. And, 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 and I think it's just the maturity, the mm -hmm. knowledge, they need to know how this asset class uh, works. Brilliant. Yeah. All right. Um, I know that we are running out of time. Maybe a few last words from <coughs> each of you. Mark, maybe you can start. Gosh, I'm fresh out of words, Bala. Um, <laughs> I, I, I guess I'll go back to my comments earlier with Jenny around having a, a long-term view, about having a 20-year a 20 view. It takes a long time to build a, a vibrant ecosystem. Phenomenons like Boulder do, don't happen uh, everywhere overnight. And um, I think helping the seed stage investors and the angel community understand how this works. Seed investing is about two things, volume and velocity. And the only way to build a vibrant, sustainable ecosystem, the foundation is the angel investors and the seed stage investors. Without that, it doesn't work. You can't just have series A investors and growth investors without significant matching seed capital prior to that. And I, I would say that probably um, having people educate, uh, th there's wealth here. There's wealth everywhere. Every, every community I've ever visited for Techstars has serious wealth around it. Um, it's finding the roots of that wealth and getting them to participate in creating a better Reykjavik, a better Iceland for the next generation. And when you educate that group, around the merits, not only the merits of seed stage investing, but how to do it, do it properly. And, and when I go back to that, I mean volume and velocity. Seed lots of companies and, and put the same amount of capital to work year in, year out. Disregard the highs and lows. At our funds, we don't think about the macro. When you're investing at the seed stage, nothing that's happening up here matters to innovative entrepreneurs. Duration of capital might be the only thing that's really in, uh, uh, affected by the macro economy, but if you ignore the noise, if you ignore the social media, like right now, um, the sky is falling. Uh, in the U.S., if you if you follow the social media, all of the talking heads saying how venture capital is drying up uh, in, in in the United States, the pace of seed investing and Series A investing in Q1 was virtually indistinguishable from Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 of last year. So it's easy to get caught up with what the media is saying, but if you put your head down and invest the same amount of capital on a at the same pace and do it year in, year out, then er your returns will, will moderate over time. But the important thing is you're not, you're not missing the innovative entrepreneurs along the way. So. Um, volume and velocity, uh, and put the money to work regularly. Svara? Yeah, I once heard that uh, you should always do it on Mondays. You know, then you won't get the emotions. Uh, they won't influence your decision when you're investing on seed states. But it was, it was a joke. <laughs> Nobody got it. Anyway, I think it's our uh, definitely a high priority in Iceland to get more money at seed states. Uh, we don't have that. We are quite dry. And I think also it's um, a combined effort from, from the funds, from the investment uh, community in Iceland and the companies to get our voice heard out there because there is a lot of interest. We just have to let people know about us. Yeah. So, Andrew? Um, I would say look internationally. Uh, look to New York and look to London. Uh, they are, it's some of the cheapest places to get through to now. So if, the, if you're willing to take that leap with some of your local investors, get on a plane, get to London, and you'll find there's ample opportunity there. And now that we know we can get our money in and out, um, it's going <laughs> <it's gonna> to make <laughs> that a whole lot more attractive. Helga, open the whole floodgates now. Jenny. Um, I guess I would say just find the right money um, for you, right? And so that might be angels that you know that are, you know, part of your community right now and or seed investors or Series A investors. And, you know, there's if you're building a great business and you're, you know, you're passionate and you're focused on the right metrics, then, you know, there's there's money out there for you. Yeah. Helga? 
Yeah, and I think also just try to have a strategy about your fundraising. Um, just like you have a strategy about your product and a strategy about your marketing and sales, have a strategy about who you want money from, when and where. So I think that's something that's useful as well. And as um, investors, we're quite happy to work with you on that strategy because we've done it before. Brilliant. Uh, thank you all very much. I'm very happy that we were able to assemble this panel. And those of you founders out there, you, you, you heard them. So get to work, I'll right? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Good one.